Back in the 1920s, two side-by-side -side developments occurred that paved the way for our modern understanding of the universe. On the theoretical side, we were able to derive that if you obeyed the laws of general relativity and had a universe that was, on average, uniformly filled with matter and energy, your universe couldn't be static and stable, but must either expand or collapse. On the observational side, we began to identify galaxies beyond the Milky Way and quickly determined that, on average, the farther away they were observed to be, the faster they were observed to be receding from us. Simply by putting theory and observation together, the notion of the expanding universe was born and has been with us ever since. Our standard model of cosmology, including the Big Bang, cosmic inflation, the formation of cosmic structure, and dark matter and dark energy, is all built upon the basic foundation of the expanding universe. But is the expanding universe an absolute necessity, or is there a way around it? In an interesting new paper that's recently gotten some publicity, theoretical physicist Lucas Lumbreezer argues that the expanding universe can be transformed away by manipulating the equations of general relativity. In his scenario, the observed cosmic expansion would merely be a mirage. But does this stand up to the science we already know? Every once in a while, we recognize that there are multiple different ways to look at the same phenomenon. If these two ways are physically equivalent, then we understand there's no difference between them and which one you choose is simply a matter of personal preference. In the science of optics, for example, you can either describe light as a wave, as Huygens did, or as a ray, as Newton did. And under most experimental circumstances, the two descriptions make identical predictions. In the science of quantum physics, where quantum operators act on quantum wave functions, you can either describe particles with a wave function that evolves and with unchanging quantum operators, or you can keep the particles unchanging and simply have the quantum operators evolve. Or, as is often the case in Einstein's relativity, you can imagine that two observers have clocks, one on the ground and one on a moving train. You can describe this equally well by two different scenarios having the ground be at rest and watching the train experience the effects of time dilation and length contraction as it's in motion, or having the train be at rest and watching the observer on the ground experience time dilation and length contraction. The latter scenario in relativity suggests to us that we might be interested in performing what mathematicians refer to as a coordinate transformation. You're probably used to thinking of coordinates the same way Rene Descartes did some 400 years ago as a grid, where all the directions, dimensions are perpendicular to one another and have the same length scales applying equally to all axes. You probably even learned about these coordinates in math class in school, Cartesian coordinates. But Cartesian coordinates aren't the only ones that are useful. If you're dealing with something that has what we call axial symmetry, symmetry about one axis, you might prefer cylindrical coordinates. If you're dealing with something that's the same in all directions around a center, it might make more sense to use spherical coordinates. And if you're dealing not only with space but with space-time, where the time dimension behaves in a fundamentally different way from the space dimensions, you're going to have a much better time if you use hyperbolic coordinates to relate space and time to one another. What's great about coordinates is this. They're just a choice. As long as you don't change the underlying physics behind a system, you're absolutely free to work in whatever coordinate system you prefer to describe whatever it is that you're considering within the universe. This freedom to choose our coordinates is akin to choosing the language in which we express the laws of nature. There's an obvious way to try and apply this to the expanding universe. Conventionally, we take note of the fact that distances in bound systems, like atomic nuclei, atoms, molecules, planets, or even star systems and galaxies don't change over time. We can use them as a ruler to measure distances equally well at any given moment. When we apply that to the universe as a whole, because we see distant, unbound galaxies receding away from one another, we conclude that the universe is expanding and work to map out how the expansion rate has changed over time. So why not do the obvious thing and flip those coordinates around to keep the distances between unbound galaxies in the universe fixed, and simply to have our rulers and all other bound structures shrink with time? It might seem like a frivolous choice to make, 
but oftentimes, in science, just by changing the way we look at a problem, we can uncover some features about it that were obscure in the old perspective, but become clear in the new one. It makes us wonder, and this is what Lombreiser explored in his new paper, just what we'd conclude about some of the biggest puzzles of all if we adopted this alternative perspective. So instead of the standard way of viewing cosmology, you can instead formulate your universe as static and non-expanding, at the expense of having masses, lengths, and timescales all change and evolve. Because the goal is to keep the structure of the universe constant, you can't have expanding, curved space that has growing density imperfections within it, and so those evolutionary effects need to be encoded elsewhere. Mass scales would have to evolve across spacetime, as would distance scales and timescales. They would have to all co-evolve together in precisely such a way that, when you put them together to describe the universe, they added up to the reverse of our standard interpretation. Alternatively, you can keep both the structure of the universe constant as well as mass scales, length scales, and time scales. But at the expense of having the fundamental constants within your universe co-evolve together in such a way that all of the dynamics of the universe get encoded onto them. You might try and argue against either of these formulations, as our conventional perspective makes more intuitive sense. But, as we mentioned earlier, if the mathematics is identical, and there are no observable differences between the predictions that either perspective make, then they all have equal validity when we try and apply them to the universe. Want to explain cosmic redshift? You can in this new picture, but in a different way. In the standard picture, an atom undergoes an atomic transition, emits a photon of a particular wavelength that photon travels through the expanding universe, which causes it to redshift as it travels. And then, when the observer receives it, it now has a longer wavelength than the same atomic transition has in the observer's laboratory. But the only observation that we can make occurs in the laboratory where we can measure the observed wavelength of the received photon and compare it to the wavelength of a laboratory photon. It could also be occurring because the mass of the electron is evolving, or because Planck's constant is evolving, or because the dimensionless fine structure constant, or some other combination of constants, is evolving. What we measure as a redshift could be due to a variety of different factors, all of which are indistinguishable from one another when you measure that distant photon's redshift. It's worth noting that this reformulation, if extended properly, would give the same type of redshift for gravitational waves too. Similarly, we could reformulate how structure grows in the universe. Normally, in the standard picture, we start out with a slightly overdense region of space, where the density in this region is just slightly above the cosmic mean. Then, over time, this gravitational perturbation preferentially attracts more matter to it than the surrounding regions causing space in that region to expand more slowly than the cosmic average. And as the density grows, it eventually crosses a critical threshold, triggering conditions where it's gravitationally bound, and then it begins gravitationally contracting, where it grows into a piece of cosmic structure like a star cluster, galaxy, or even larger collection of galaxies. However, instead of following the evolution of a cosmic overdensity or of the density field in some sense, you can replace that with a combination of mass scales, distance scales, and time scales evolving instead. Similarly, Planck's constant, the speed of light, and the gravitational constant could evolve alternatively instead. What we see as a growing cosmic structure could be a result not of cosmic growth, but of these parameters fundamentally changing over time, leaving the observables, like structures and their observed sizes, unchanged. If you take this approach, however unpalatable it may seem, you can try and reinterpret some of the presently inexplicable properties our universe seems to possess. For example, there's the cosmological constant problem, where for some reason, the universe behaves as though it were filled with a field of constant energy density inherent to space, an energy density that doesn't dilute or change in value as the universe expands. This wasn't important long ago, but appears to be important now only because the matter density has diluted below a certain critical threshold. We don't know why space should have this non-zero energy density or why it should take on the value that's consistent with our observed dark energy. In the standard picture, it's just an unexplained mystery. 
However, in this reformulated approach, there's a relationship between the value of the cosmological constant and, if you have mass scales and distance scales changing according to the new formulation, the inverse of the Planck length squared. Sure, the Planck length changes as the universe evolves in this new formulation, but it evolves biased towards the observer. The value we observe now has the value that it has now simply because it's now. If times, masses, and lengths all evolve together, then that eliminates what we call the coincidence problem in cosmology. Any observer will observe their effective cosmological constant to be important now because their now keeps evolving with cosmic time. Imagine a universe where dark matter is a geometric consequence of particle masses increasing in a converging manner during the early epochs of the cosmos. Similarly, dark energy could be reinterpreted as a geometric effect, where particle masses diverge at later times, driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. This reformation could introduce CP violation, one of the critical ingredients needed to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry in our universe. Such bold reimaginings lead to a plethora of intriguing possibilities. However, we must tread carefully. Our laboratory measurements here on Earth provide a robust anchor for our theories. Any new theory must reconcile with these terrestrial observations to be viable.